Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to our OTC live event on the Gemini ROV system. My name is Bernie McCoy, and I'm with Technip FMC. I'm our global service leader for the subsea whales businesses, which include drilling, ROVs, and interventions. I'm privileged to be here with Peter McKinnis, a close friend of mine, and we're here to discuss uh, the Gemini system. Peter has over 30 or 10 years in the subsea robotics business, starting out as an ROV pilot in the North Sea. He's had a progressive career through product management and business development roles that are focused on the development of major technological advances in the ROV capabilities. Over half of his career has been with Technip FMC, including VP of Sales of the Schilling Robotics Business Unit, which delivered over 200 ROVs. Following this, he spent most recently his last five years focused on product development and commercialization of Technip FMC's Gemini ROV system. Uh, which is here to transform ROV productivity for all of our customers. Peter will provide a detailed overview of the system, but before we get there, I'd like to provide some context and explain why this technical progression creates the next wave of capability in the subsea industry. As I moved up through uh, my career, I started off in the surface wellhead business. And when I think about that time, I think about the incredible amount of uh, expectations that we have on our men and women in the field. They have to be able to plan, they have to be calm under pressure, they have to have situational awareness, problem solving, adapt to conditions. Uh, they have to have eye-hand coordination and dexterity and, and force uh, compliance, ability to apply different amounts of force at different times. As I made my own transition from the surface business into the subsea business, and I started to install subsea wellheads over surface wellheads. I saw a major limitation that I didn't see there before. What was commonplace for me in the surface business was to bring all of my tools to the job site, to bring all of contingency tools to the job site. And yet, as I worked on the rig floor offshore and we deployed what was uh, ROV to do the subsea work, it was very limited. We had limited amount of tools. We, it took time to get to the job site. And things that I took for granted, like bringing all of your tools to the job site, bring your truck loaded with all of your tools that our men and women do today in our industry, that just wasn't possible due to technology in the subsea business. And even more so, when you start to watch the subsea work or the ROV work on the job site, it has limited dexterity. It would go through operations and, and fumble and be clumsy. And this is just the way that our industry has operated for many years. It's taken for granted that the ROV will be a limit to the subsea job work site underwater. And Peter, one of the things I'm excited to hear about today is how we've transformed those limitations and actually improved the subsea worker, the ROV. Marie, thank you very much for the, uh, the introduction. I uh, look forward to uh, sharing this information with the audience and I appreciate everybody uh, calling in today uh, to, to take this uh, valuable time and uh, learn about Gemini. So uh, as Bernie said, uh, the, the question at hand is really, uh, how can subsea work be as productive as a surface work and, and this image just shows you firsthand that uh, your, your onshore, your surface team, they can be right there with all the tools they need, uh, easy access, easy to change the plan if needed. Uh, they, they can basically work on the, the, uh, the, the fly and adapt. It's much more difficult when you're in the subsea environment. And just to give you the context of the subsea environment that we're talking about here, we're talking about deep water drill ships, deep water semi-submersibles, working around the world uh, in the oceans of the Gulf of Mexico, North Sea, offshore Brazil, Asia Pacific, West Africa, extremely remote locations. And they're relying on the work class ROVs on these deep water rigs to perform work that's up to 3,000 meters uh, uh, beneath the, uh, the surface, or maybe even up to 4,000 uh, uh, meters in some occasions. So the, the robot uh, is really needing to be at the work site all the time, the work site being the seafloor where the equipment is. And to do that, you really need to be able to carry all of the tools with you, all of the consumables, 
just like the surface worker can do. So here you can see an illustration of Gemini. It gives you some degree of perspective of the scale of the system on board a deep water drill rig. We're a very small part of a very large vessel, but that vessel can be costing up to $1 million per day for the EMP company to operate. So every hour of time is critical. Uh, you need to be working on the seafloor. It's no use to have the ROV on deck. The work takes place underneath the water and that's where you need to be and have all your tools readily available. So why Gemini? Why did we go down this path of developing the technology? As, as Bernie mentioned in the introduction, your offshore worker requires many skill sets. And in addition to being able to pilot the vehicle and operate the tools and work with the manipulator arms, which is the fun part of the job, speaking from personal experience, uh, you also generally have to have a tremendous number of additional skills, particularly in regard to having electronics capability, uh, hydraulic system uh, knowledge, uh, electrical skills, maybe even some software skills to interface uh, different tools and equipment to the vehicle. Then you have to have all of your problem solving skills, the ability to work well with the client, uh, maybe even have some knowledge of the actual uh, task at hand that's being performed uh, beyond just piloting the vehicle. It's very difficult to train uh, large numbers of people to be experts in such a wide variety of skill sets. And when we identified this five years ago in the uh, initial development of the Gemini program, we then looked at well, what, which skill sets are the most difficult to acquire and perform uh, precisely and, and uh, repeatedly. And the, uh, the answer is that it's, uh, it's really in regard to the piloting and the tool operation. So Gemini focuses on delivering automation capabilities uh, to enhance the pilot's skill set and make sure that whichever pilot is operating the vehicle can operate it to an exceptionally high standard and perform extremely well. So unlike today's situation where you may only have uh, one expert pilot on your team and two that have less experience. Uh, from this point forward, you can really have a team of extremely capable, highly competent people operating the vehicle. So to put some of this into context and perspective, uh, this video shows a traditional legacy work class ROV performing a valve operation on a subsea manifold. The video is increased in speed by a factor of 20 times. And you can see in the timer clock in the top left of the screen uh, how much time is elapsing. The important thing to understand here is that the movement of these two manipulators, the port grabber on the left and the starboard uh, position control manipulator on the, on the right of your screen, uh, there's a human on surface instructing these manipulator arms to make every single movement that you see materialize. Now this is actually a very competent crew. They complete the valve operation in about 45 minutes, including the recovery of the tool. But you can see how difficult it was for them to first acquire it because they have to use a simple uh, rope interface in the form of a monkey's fist. There's a simple mechanical handle that they can acquire as well. But you can see the bundle of hydraulic service line hoses connecting that tool to the main vehicle hydraulics. You can also see additional tie wrap, duct tape, rope. All of these service interfaces are basically obstructing the task at hand, making it more difficult for the, uh, the pilot to complete the, uh, the desired work scope. But still, this particular crew did a very good job. It's an example of uh, a talented crew performing the work and achieving the task in 45 minutes. But it's not really reflective of where robotics should be in, uh, in the year 2021. So let's take a look at uh, Gemini and uh, first of all, contrast it to legacy ROV operations. And uh, with a legacy ROV, uh, it's important to understand that the, uh, the system is non-productive during the phases of launch and recovery, uh, system, reconfigure system reconfiguration and weather delays. As you can see in the clock in the top left and hand of your screen there, uh, many hours can pass by while you're waiting on the, the, uh, the weather to clear. 
Then when you can dive, uh, depending on the water depth, it can take easily up to two hours from the time that you start to launch the vehicle to the time you're at the uh, work site. Once you're at the uh, work site, in this case, a subsea BOP, you're then completely relying on the pilot skill to perform the task. Pilot will then use the port uh, grabber to stabilize the vehicle attaching to a grab handle. In this case, we're using the starboard manipulator with a hot stab to perform an intervention task. And in the worst case scenario, you can actually drop the tool. And at this point, you can take many hours to recover from that type of situation. So Gemini has been designed to really address all of these uh, uh, limitations with legacy work class ROV technology. It can remain underwater for 30 days at a time dive duration. It's a 250 horsepower work class vehicle with twin integrated uh, force compliant manipulator systems. Over 30 tools are permanently available uh, for subsea operation. There's next generation station keep control with accuracy of 25 millimeters and comprehensive 60 minute maintenance uh, design. Additionally, the vehicle permanently can carry 100 gallons of intervention fluid and it features machine vision based cameras that deliver the automation that we're gonna talk about in this, uh, in this presentation. In the front porch of the vehicle, there's a tooling carousel that can accommodate up to 15 tools, and we have 30 unique tools available. We'll talk about how those additional tools can be acquired as well. And to make it such a consistent operation and seamless and easy for any operator, it's a one button operation to switch between tools. So here you can see that the pilot has selected to store the hot stab and the unified interface that we developed on the end of the manipulator provides all of the hydraulic power, optical communications, and inductive electrical power to run uh, all of the tools that are available for the system. The carousel that then rotates to the desired location of the tool that's being acquired. Here it's a class 3-4 uh, torque tool. And then it on, then automatically positions that tool in front of the vehicle ready for the pilot to operate it. And it's important to understand here that all of the service lines, the electrical power, data communications, hydraulic power, that now all runs through the main body of the manipulator. You no longer have to deal with those extraneous interface lines that make the task more difficult. So Gemini can really complete tasks in minutes, not hours. If we look at the example given in the, the legacy ROV case, uh, the vehicle is permanently underwater. And when we approach the intervention panel, uh, the machine vision system is now able to analyze the intervention panel. It uses that for positional reference, allows the vehicle to stay precisely on location to 25 millimeter accuracy. accuracy. We no longer have to attach the vehicle to the structure using a port manipulator. The pilot uh, then instructs the vehicle to exchange the tools. It stores the uh, torque tool in this case rotates the carousel to acquire the hot stab. This is uh, done in two minutes every single time, and we'll watch some video of that later. And then the hot stab is positioned uh, in front of the intervention panel. And at this point, the pilot uses uh, a game controller, PlayStation controller that you can see in the top right, to simply control the X, Y, Z uh, uh, motion of the tip of the tool. And the automatic force compliance that's built into the arms eliminates any unwanted forces. And finally, you complete the intervention task by applying the hydraulic fluid and transferring it through the vehicle, through the arm, through the hot stab into the BOP. So that's a quick overview of the vehicle and the tooling, but we also talked about the additional tools. The fact that you can carry these additional tools on the TMS means you can carry larger tools, you can carry all of your consumables that are required for the job, and they're acquired in exactly the same way as they are from the carousel. The technology, the machine vision, uh, aligns with the uh, target tool. It follows the motion of the uh, TMS and that tool, and it then acquires it, removes it from the TMS, and then the pilot can fly back to the work site and continue the planned operations. So we're gonna get into looking at a lot of video and uh, looking at some of the performance of the Gemini system in the last year that it's been working in the field. First thing I'd like to convey is this is an evolution of productivity uh, advancements. Uh, Schilling Robotics, which Bernie mentioned in the beginning, uh, has been owned by Technip FMC for uh, about a decade. 
And uh, we've seen uh, a progression on the deployment of technologies that enhance the productivity of our leads in the field. So going back 20 years ago, the focus was on developing control systems uh, that benefited from uh, Ethernet technology in terms of simplification and transferring a lot of the electronics from the vehicle up to the surface, which increases reliability, performance, efficiency, connectivity, et cetera. Then in 2007, they launched the HD ROV, which uh, really transformed uh, how long it took to perform maintenance in ROVs. So when uh, something needs to be worked on, maintained, or repaired, or replaced, you no longer need to have that component level capability of your technicians. Your technicians simply uh, identify which module needs to be replaced. You undo a couple of bolts, you replace that module, and you're back up and working again extremely quickly, in many cases in under 60 minutes. Then in 2013, uh, we were seeing greater demands on work-class ROVs for fluid intervention. Uh, pressures and flows of up to 50 gallons per minute and 5,000 PSI were being required by the industry. And so we developed a, a very advanced uh, fluid intervention system and a pump that's called the Isolate Pump that we'll review in, uh, in some detail today. And then those evolutions of core subsystems, modular maintenance, comprehensive fluid intervention, all of those same subsystems are part of Gemini. Gemini really takes a one big step forward where we deliver precision robotics with machine vision to automate a lot of the work that normally requires very skilled people to perform. We can now allow those people to focus on the performance of the project work at hand and not just be ROV pilots. To do that, they can now stay underwater with uh, the vehicle for one month at a time. Uh, every single tool exchange can be completed in two minutes. Uh, we can engage with the subsea panel and complete the task in five minutes. And we've extended the 60 minute maintenance philosophy further across the system, including the manipulators now. So even these very advanced manipulators, any modular part can be re replaced in under an hour if it's ever needed. So let's take a closer look at some of the tooling. <clears throat> this is not all of the tools that are available for Gemini, but it's a decent uh, selection. And these tools are permanently available on every single dive. So you have a selection of manipulator jaws. You have your class one, two, class three, four torque tools. You have a variety of uh, cleaning tools, a brush tool, a hub cleaner tool. You have various hot stabs, single port, dual port, seal tests. Uh, you have a variety of other unique tools, such as a high, high pressure uh, water jetting tool. Uh, various cutters for soft line, hard line, grinding tools, pH meters, uh, basically all the tools that you need. And some of the larger tools at the top there, we have a dredging tool that can be acquired by the uh, port manipulator, and also the high flow hot stab that's used for API 53 compliance that we'll also talk a little bit more about later in the presentation. So these tools all have one unique thing in common, which is their interface. You'll notice here there are no extra hoses, no extra cables. This is all you need, you only need the tool. So these tools connect to either the port or starboard manipulator through the unified interface. And that unified interface features these three key components. You have your hydraulic supply, you have your uh, electrical power providing up to 120 watts power to the, uh, the tool if needed, and you have optical communications providing 100 megabit per second uh, uh, ethernet link uh, for data and video. So this is a game changer in, uh, in the industry. This uh, new unique, uh, unique uh, interface allows you to connect any single tool to either manipulator without having to have those extra service lines tied back to, uh, to the main vehicle. So the benefit of this is uh, no longer having those, uh, those restrictions. Uh, those those cables, those electrical uh, lines, the, the rope, etc., you rely very much on every single member of the ROV crew to configure all of that correctly every single time. If any of the hose lines are too short or the rope is tied in the wrong place or you don't have sufficient tie backs with duct tape or tie wrap, etc., it's very easy for uh, those, uh, those service lines to become a problem when you get to the work site and sometimes you have to recover just to reconfigure and then try again. All of those problems go away by being able to have the tool at the end of the arm ready to use 
and be able to switch out between any of those tools. Now, the big advancement with Gemini uh, is machine vision, true machine vision, where there are five machine vision cameras on the vehicle. And the machine vision cameras uh, can look at what, uh, what looks like QR codes, that little symbol in the middle of the screen, we, uh, we sometimes call them fiducials. And these are two dimensional images uh, which are placed in uh, adjacent to each of the tools, either on the tool carousel, as you can see on the, uh, the bottom right hand image of, uh, of the screen there, uh, or on the, uh, the tether management system where we carry tools and consumables as well. <clears throat> and the benefit of these two dimensional uh, fiducials is that it allows the machine vision cameras to determine a three dimensional algorithm to determine the trajectory for moving the arm to connect with any of these tools. And that allows it to do it very quickly and complete the entire operation in under two minutes, irrespective of who is performing the operation. Because as you can see in the image in the top right, it's a one touch operation. All that pilot has to do is select the one tool that they want and the machine will then take care of the rest. It's also important to understand that this is not like a CNC machine. It's not a highly pre-programmed set of operations. The machine vision system is applying intelligence to understand exactly where the target is, and it will make any slight movements or adjustments in the position of the arm to account for any offsets. In this video here, we'll uh, take a look at uh, tooling exchange. So there's going to be four camera views uh, visible to you. One, the main pilot's view, uh, where we have two, two operators, which is normal configuration in the industry. On the top left, we have an observation ROV that's simply there to uh, uh, take video. It's not there for any particular uh, operational reason. And in the bottom left, uh, you're going to see the manipulator camera view from the uh, port manipulator. And then the bottom right, you'll see the Gemini main uh, machine vision camera. So the pilots, as you will notice in the top right image, uh, have simply selected uh, the tool that they desire. And you will notice that they're no longer performing any operations. They are now operating in what we call supervised autonomy mode. They're monitoring the machine, performing all of these actions under its own control. And we'll talk about supervised autonomy a little bit more and what that means for the industry going forward. But after storing the tool in the spare slot in the carousel, the carousel then rotates to the desired position where it's going to acquire the hot stat. The latches open on the unified interface. The machine vision camera is now looking at the uh, QR code. It's determining the 3D algorithm for the, the, the uh, trajectory that it needs to follow. And now it's moving in, and when you see those latches uh, lock into place, all of your service lines are being uh, made up at one time. Your hydraulics, your electrical power, and your optical communications, if needed. In this case, with the hot staff, it's only your hydraulic power that would be utilized. So that always takes two minutes, uh, no matter which pilot is performing the particular task. This video really shows you the most complex task that can ever be required. You're flying the vehicle mid-water. You're not attached to the tether management system physically. You're relying completely on the station keep control of the vehicle. And the system is automatically acquiring tooling. This is an AXVX uh, seal tool that it's acquiring from the tether management system. You can see from the observation uh, uh, vehicle that's, uh, that's taking this video uh, that there's movement of the TMS. There is an underwater current. You can see the particles moving in the water. And so the vehicle is having to address all of this while it's acquiring the tool. This would be an extremely difficult task for a highly experienced pilot to do. And with Gemini, you can do this all day long, as many times as needed, and it will only take a couple of minutes. Now, the way that this system works is it's kind of uh, interesting, but it's a little bit like uh, a fighter pilot. And a fighter pilot, when they lock, a, lock onto a target, uh, they get a red, yellow, green indicator. Uh, red means you're not in position, yellow means you're getting close, green means you're on target, and the machine vision system can take over. 
So as the pilot approaches the TMS, they simply have to fly it into the position where they follow that red, yellow, green indicator. Once they get the green, they then activate machine vision and the tool can automatically be acquired. Here you can see some operational video from uh, uh, work that's been performed in the Gulf of Mexico over the, the last uh, 10 to 12 months. Uh, it gives you some good close-ups of the tooling acquisition. Here you can see the cutter that's been acquired to remove uh, soft line that's uh, entangled with the uh, BOP interface uh, or intervention panel. Uh, this is a great shot giving you a close-up of the machine vision camera looking at the fiducial on the, uh, the, the uh, tool slot in the carousel where we're storing the uh, high pressure water jet. The high pressure water jet was then used to uh, remove hydrate uh, buildup on the underside of the connector. And lastly, here we're in uh, shallow water, uh, about 60 feet or so, switching out between the hot stab tool and manipulator jaws and using these jaws just to uh, move some down lines that had uh, moved around after a, a storm that had passed through the Gulf. So just a few examples of, uh, of the uh, actual machine uh, uh, working in anger, uh, doing exactly what it's supposed to do. And you can see the flexibility that you have uh, in being able to switch between a multitude of tools uh, very quickly. So this starts to give you that, that capability of the, uh, the surface worker that we talked about in the beginning. You have access to everything that you need underwater, all the tools, all the consumables, you can work at any depth from shallow water to deep water. You don't have to return to surface. You don't have to reconfigure and any pilot can perform the work efficiently and expeditiously. To put that into more context for you and to really show the demonstrated value that has been proven with Gemini in the last year, this particular slide illustrates the process that's needed to install a subsea tree. Uh, the process will vary based on uh, the particular tree, but this particular one requires 16 different stats. Those 16 different stats are illustrated with the purple boxes in the, uh, the process chart you see on the left side of your screen. And on the right side of the, uh, the screen, you can see the nine individual tools that were actually required. So because nine individual tools were needed to perform this work scope, a traditional work class ROV would have returned to surface uh, at least once to be reconfigured, maybe twice. But uh, assuming that it would have only had to be recovered once and reconfigured, the time savings with Gemini were almost 13 hours of critical path rig time. So when you're operating a vessel that has a total uh, running cost of a million dollars per day, uh, your hourly running costs are $40,000 per hour or so, uh, being able to save this amount of time has a really meaningful impact on, uh, on, your, uh, on your project. Lastly, I'd just like to touch on the Gemini Systems API 53 compliance. And this relates to having the ability to uh, operate the shear rounds on a DOP and both close the, uh, the, 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 the rounds and shear either the drill string or casing that's inside the bore of the BOP and accomplish all of that within 45 seconds. So to achieve that, and this goes back to the year 2013 when this uh, industry requirement was, uh, was first identified, uh, it was a pretty big challenge to deliver uh, the amount of pressure and flow required from a traditional work class ROV system because you needed up to 50 gallons per minute at 5,000 PSI simultaneously. And most ROVs could do one or the other, but not both at the same time. So various industry solutions were developed. And in our case, we developed the, uh, the isolate pump. The isolate pump is uh, illustrated in the bottom right-hand corner of the, uh, the screen there. It sits above the main 250 horsepower HPU uh, that, that runs the vehicle. And uh, to give you some perception of the, uh, of the scale, if you're old enough to remember uh, the days that we carried a briefcase to the office, it's uh, a little bit larger than uh, your typical briefcase. So it's a very compact unit, yet it can provide a terrific amount of power to be able to do this, uh, this type of task. It's also able to operate with, uh, with multiple different fluids, including hydraulic oil, uh, water glycol fluids, 
And uh, because of its titanium construction, it can uh, pump seawater all day long without having a problem. So if you need to uh, have unlimited supply of fluid, you can ultimately pump seawater if, uh, if it's needed. The really neat thing is this capability is permanently integrated within the vehicle as well. Uh, you'll notice one thing that we haven't talked about with Gemini is additional skids. Uh, additional skids have been commonplace in the ROV industry for decades. What does that mean? Skids are generally an additional piece of equipment that is either attached to the underside of the vehicle or the aft of the vehicle, sometimes even the sides, uh, but mostly they are underswung beneath the vehicle. And uh, adding those skids, which generally carry fluids or carry pumping systems or other uh, tooling or tooling baskets to maybe try and carry some more tools to the work site, that takes time. When you're on deck, you have to move the vehicle, you have to slide the skids underneath, you have to connect them physically with docking pins, you have to interface them with hydraulic hoses, et cetera, to the machine. And that completely goes away with Gemini. Uh, you have this comprehensive fluid intervention capability nicely integrated within the system. On the image on the left, you can see that we have fluid reservoirs, uh, which can carry 100 gallons of these intervention fluids that we're talking about in saddlebags on the, uh, the upper portion of the vehicle. We also, at the aft of the vehicle, have uh, reservoirs that can take trash fluids when required for closed loop operations. And uh, uh, you have access permanently to 100 gallons of intervention fluid with a pump that can deliver 50 GPM at 5,000 PSI and uh, give you a tremendous amount of flexibility and variation. So let's look at that pump in a little more detail. What is the isolate pump? Well, it's actually eight separate dual reciprocating pumps that all work in parallel together. And they're driven by software from the surface. And that software control allows you to vary their output completely remotely without having to physically change anything on the actual uh, ROV system or the pump itself. You can pump up to two fluids simultaneously. You can use six of the pumping modules for one fluid, two of the pumping modules for a secondary fluid. And in the case of BOP intervention, you would actually use all eight of the uh, reciprocating pumps working in parallel together to deliver the maximum pressure and flow that's, uh, that's needed. So some actual video of trials that we did uh, back in 2014 or so uh, with a major ENP company and uh, a BOP manufacturer. Uh, this is video from inside the bore of the BOP where the isolate pump is actually being used to uh, drive the, sh the shear rams closed. So we've got the high flow part that's driving the, uh, the, the rams closed. Once they connect with the circumference of the uh, drill string or casing, the pressure then intensifies up to 5,000 PSI. Uh, the shearing operation then uh, is completed. And then the rams continue to close until the bore of the, uh, the BOP is completely sealed. So a uh, very dramatic video. Uh, you can see uh, how effective it is as you keep watching it here. Uh, and really neat that you have this degree of safety compliance permanently integrated within the, uh, the ROV. It's not an optional uh, feature that, uh, that has to be bolted on, uh, which can take many hours to, uh, to do. So uh, the results of the tests, we actually conducted uh, shearing tests on eight different samples. Uh, the video here shows, uh, I think, what most engineers would call a very satisfying day at the office. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, the visuals there are pretty conclusive. Uh, I think they're self-explanatory in terms of seeing the uh, successful shearing on the different drill string and casing samples. Uh, and, uh, and it's important to say that these tests were all completed successfully on the first attempt. We didn't have to have any second uh, efforts to try, and, uh, to try and complete the cut. They were all successful on the, uh, the first time. And when you look at the data associated with, uh, with that performance, of the eight samples, uh, the column that is highlighted in this table here illustrates the total time that was required to uh, close the rounds shear the drill string or casing and seal the BOP. And so the API 53 requirement is uh, 45 seconds. And the longest time that it took us to achieve that is highlighted lighted there with a 16 inch casing and it was a total of 37.5 seconds. 
so well within uh, the API 53 requirements. And this system uh, actually also lends itself well to uh, 20K systems, uh, which are starting to, uh, to come into uh, existence in the industry. So in conclusion, um, Gemini, uh, it's really transforming subsea robotics. It is a fully integrated uh, system whereby the ROV, the manipulators and the tooling all work very seamlessly together. Uh, we have dual automated manipulators in the front porch of the vehicle. Both manipulators can acquire any of the 30 tools that are permanently available subsea. Both of the manipulators feature force compliance, which eliminates the risk of damaging any subsea tooling or any subsea interfaces on the intervention panel. And that happens completely automatically without any human intervention. It's got a very advanced, highly capable fluid intervention system on board with the isolate pump, which enables us to comply with the BOP intervention requirements that the industry has set. It's a 250 horsepower work class vehicle, most powerful that's generally available in the industry today, giving you complete flexibility to uh, perform a wide variety of tasks, anything that would be required in relation to drilling and completion operations. Uh, we have the huge advancement in machine vision. Uh, th this is game changing again in the industry. This machine vision technology, it enables the precision uh, that we deliver in terms of station keep. You can stay on position to 25 millimeters without any additional movement of the vehicle. And you can do that on a continual basis. It will sit there all day long with that degree of accuracy without drifting off, uh, off station. And the machine vision then also enables the pilots to uh, perform the task flawless, flawlessly. They simply select the tool that they want. Either of the manipulators acquires the tool. It's always done in two minutes. When they then engage with the intervention panel, they simply, simply use a game controller joystick to control the XYZ Cartesian movement of either manipulator. And the force compliance ensures that we don't damage any of the tooling or uh, any of the intervention panel interfaces that you are working with. So that is our uh, presentation on Gemini today. Uh, hope that you found it interesting and I'd like to open the floor to uh, dialogue and questions. Thanks, Peter. This is super fascinating. And I think those videos are very compelling. Uh, we actually have members of the audience from all over the world. So we have members of the audience from Angola, Algeria, Turkey, Canada, the US, etc. So quite exciting. Uh, now is your time, members of the audience, to post your questions inside the platform you're using, whether that's YouTube or LinkedIn. We will answer those. And while you're thinking about your questions, I'll go ahead and ask Peter a couple of pre-submitted questions. <clears throat> Uh, Peter, you mentioned the QR codes identify the positions of the tools. Does that mean that there has to be visual cues and QR codes on the subsea production system? Yeah, so uh, the answer is, uh, is no. Uh, the, the benefit of the QR codes is that it allows the machine vision cameras to quickly determine the three-dimensional algorithm in order to move the manipulator arm in the correct trajectory to acquire the tooling. So that enables the rapid two minute tool exchange. However, when the machine vision system is, uh, is looking at a subsequent intervention panel, whether it's on a manifold, a tree, a BOP, doesn't matter, it can be anything. Uh, it does not require uh, those fiducials. It can still use the reference points that it sees. It looks at the, uh, the target image and it identifies, for example, the hot stab receptacles or the uh, torque tool valve locations. And uh, it uses those as positional reference points, but it doesn't get quite the degree of precision that it gets from uh, the fiducials. So it can take a little longer. It can take up to five minutes to physically engage the tool with a panel. Uh, but it's not necessary to actually have those fiducials on the actual intervention panel. Very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, another uh, pre-submitted question. Uh, can the tools only be switched out once per dive or are they able to be exchanged multiple times? Okay. Yeah. So the, the, the unified inter interface allows uh, any tool to be acquired any number of times in a single dive. 
So while you're underwater for a one month duration, if you needed to switch between just the hot stab and the torque tool, and you had to do that a hundred times, you could do that a hundred times. Uh, the uh, interface connections that you see on these manipulator arms have been tested extensively over uh, the last four or five years. Uh, this was clearly one of the, the most complex technological developments that we had to uh, make a significant advancement on. And uh, we worked on it early in the, uh, the development program. And so for, for several years, we've been testing make break connections of tools to these interface getting thousands of hours of, uh, of time proven, um, both you know, in, in surface and the la uh, laboratory environment. But also over the last year, we've been working uh, with these uh, multiple of these systems now in the field uh, and performing tool exchanges daily at operational depth. Uh, and uh, yeah, you know, sometimes we're underwater for two weeks and uh, changing between tools dozens of times uh, without returning to surface. No, excellent, very, very interesting. Uh, we actually got a question coming from David, uh, who's in Nigeria. He's asking, what is the relationship between machine learning and machine vision, if any? That is a terrific question. So there is absolutely a, a relationship. And uh, machine vision is what we're using with Gemini. Uh, machine learning is another step forward whereby uh, if you're wanting the machine to uh, automatically identify things such as uh, anomalies, for example, if you were doing a, a, a riser survey as an example, uh, the machine uh, learning would allow the system to automatically detect any, anom any anomalies and uh, uh, make the pilot aware of that and make uh, uh, an automatic recording of, uh, of, of that. So machine vision, the difference is that the machine vision system is uh, uh, really just delivering an additional level of intelligence that enables the pilots to focus on their, their core task of supporting the customer and the project. Uh, it, it's performing the, the, the difficult work of trying to uh, work in a three-dimensional world with only two-dimensional images. And it just removes that uh, that challenge for the operator. Now, the the, uh, the beauty uh, of this machine vision system is that it directly lends itself towards machine learning. And so, uh, we will be rolling out additional features that benefit from this core uh, machine vision capability. I mean, we have five machine vision cameras on the system. Uh, so the, the, uh, these, these systems are uh, gathering a lot of data, a lot of information about their subsea. And uh, we are going to be able to uh, quickly deploy uh, new features and capabilities that start to take you into the machine learning capabilities of automation going forward. Very, very interesting. Uh, for members of the audience, uh, you can find this information and more at our website, technipfmc.com. Uh, you can find this information uh, on the Gemini ROV system, and some of the videos that you saw today are also available. Uh, Peter, we have a really interesting question from uh, Dinesh joining us on YouTube. Can you describe more of the fiber connection to the external tooling? Uh, how does it expel the water? Well, uh, it's the, 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 I can't say that I am uh, uh, the, uh, the engineer here to uh, thoroughly explain that, but um, uh, these are industrial grade solutions that have been uh, essentially marinized to work in the, uh, in the subsea world. And when the, the, the tooling um, interface is connected with the, the unified end effector, uh, all three of those services are connected at the one time. Uh, and the reason I'm describing those three services is that there's a physical connection with the hydraulics, but then the electrical power is inductive. And so it's not a physical connector that makes and breaks, okay? It's inductive electrical power. Uh, and then the fiber optic connection, uh, there's a small gap there between the, the, the two sides of the fiber optic connection, but close enough such that you get flawless uh, communications between the two and speeds of up to 100 megabits per second. 
So the, the, the mechanical uh, aspect of that interface is uh, it, it's very rudimentary. Uh, really, when you connect the male and female, the tool has the, uh, the male side of the interface. The uh, manipulator arm has the female side of the, uh, the interface. Uh, the, the precision that exists there in that mechanical design uh, displaces any of the water and uh, allows those uh, uh, those three components of the tooling interface to to mate up, uh, both physically and inductively and optically. I hope that helps. No, a, a very very good answer. A uh, number of members of the audience, uh, Peter, are commending you for a great presentation and interesting tech. We have Andre from Brazil. Uh, we have uh, James and we have David all commenting that they've really enjoyed the presentation. So thank you all for the comments. Please do continue to put any questions you have in the chat and we will answer those. Uh, we'll go back to one of the questions from uh, the pre-submission and that's for Gemini to be mobilized uh, offshore, does the rig have to be in port or can it be mobilized at sea? So uh, I think that anytime you can mobilize equipment uh, in port, it's certainly uh, desirable. Uh, of course, with uh, these mobile offshore drilling units, uh, they very seldom uh, go into port. So uh, we did actually design the Gemini system such that it can be uh, readily mobilized uh, offshore. Uh, we, we have in-house engineering services that can perform all of the mobilization engineering uh, and planning that's required for such uh, complex installations. Uh, there's a modularity that exists within the whole system. Uh, of course, there's the work van, there's a control van, those are generally 20-foot systems. Uh, we have the watch and recovery A-frame, uh, the uh, main HPU, the umbilical winch, the tether management system and the vehicle itself. Uh, but uh, certainly the, the, we have um, multiple systems in the, the field at the moment. Uh, all of them have uh, essentially been mobilized offshore. Uh, so absolutely it can be done. Um, and the modular approach that we've taken to uh, all of the different interfaces. So for example, the, the connections between auxiliary HPUs and the uh, um, uh, A-frames uh, and uh, uh, the the, uh, the surface components of the uh, the system on deck. Those have all been modularized as uh, as much as possible to allow for easy and quick interfacing in uh, in that environment. Oh, very interesting. I think we got enough time for uh, one more question. We got uh, Iswan joining us from uh, YouTube. Uh, with the higher level of automation, has the Gemini system impacted the ability to operate the system offshore? either with less crew or faster training time to get the pilots up to their technical competencies? Yeah, so the, the uh, supervised autonomy mode that we described uh, really does enable anybody to operate Gemini. Um, we, uh, we have done uh, you know, onshore demonstrations uh, with, uh, with customers, employees, executive management, and anybody can, can sit at the uh, control console and uh, acquire a tool and insert that tool and perform uh, an intervention uh, operation. So, so absolutely, it greatly uh, optimizes the ability to uh, work with a multitude of people who can now operate the ROV system. And what that lends itself well to is at Technic FMC, we, we define it as integrated crewing. So rather than having to send out separate teams uh, for tree installation, uh, for IWOX uh, operations, uh, and ROV system operations, you can start to integrate those crews. And that really results in true crew reduction offshore while ensuring that you still have extremely talented personnel available offshore, that they now no longer have to have skills that uh, are, are really kind of defunct in the modern day robotics uh, uh, world. You know, there's, there's, there's not really any, I mean, can anybody think of a time when you took any of your home electronics to a store to get them repaired? Uh, you, just, you just don't do it anymore. Uh, even if you take your car in for maintenance or repair, 
Um, the technicians don't don't fix anything at a component level. Those those days are history. They just replace a module and they do it quickly. And you can probably get your car back uh, the same morning or the same day. So uh, the, the it's not just about the uh, the automation aspects of Gemini. It's going back to that slide where we talked about the progression of productivity. Uh, it's 20 years in the making, and uh, this combination of <clears throat> easily and rapidly changing out uh, uh, modules, the fluid intervention capability, the automation that now exists, uh, it does truly lend itself to true crew integration, which does lend itself to true crew reduction. And of course, we actually uh, uh, have the ability to control these systems remotely from shore as well. It's pretty common practice in the industry these days. Uh, you can do it through uh, 4G uh, communications or satellite communications. We've demonstrated this using uh, VSAT communications between shore and offshore. Uh, but the huge step forward that you achieve here to be able to truly deliver remote operations is the, the super high autonomy. You no longer need those flawless communications because when you rely on pilots making every single movement of the manipulators, you know, a few milliseconds of delay uh, impacts the operation. So now you can simply have the pilots instruct the machine to perform a task. And once you've instructed it, once the machines receive that instruction, it then executes that task through completion. So you, you, you can get away from that need to have uh, uh, pilots permanently in control of the vehicle, making every single fine movement of both the vehicle and the arms uh, uh, by themselves. You're now just instructing the machine to perform a task. So, sorry, very long answer to a short question. But uh, uh, that is the direction that this technology is going and enabling both what we call crew integration and crew reduction. Absolutely. And, and I think it's, uh, it's uh, time to see that in this particular part of the industry to see automation aid and uh, reduce some of the complexities that we've seen. And Dave and I talked about it at the beginning of the program. And you yourself witnessed 30 years ago becoming a pilot for the first time struggling in the industry. Uh, again, uh, feel free to go to technipfmc.com for more information on the Gemini ROV system. Feel free also to use the LinkedIn platform to uh, direct message Peter or I if you have any questions. Peter, thank you for your time today and a very fascinating presentation. I wish everybody uh, good health and we will talk again sometime in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Bernie, and thank you for everyone attending. Thank you.